everyone's doing well this evening. This is the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Jojage, which has uh, long been a meeting point of, uh, of various First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. Hope, uh, hope everyone is uh, uh, doing well this evening. This is a uh, 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 Haiti, no to Haiti, no to Canadian invasion of Haiti, a uh, special uh, uh, session of the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, where I'm going to try to go into uh, a bit of history of Canada's role in Haiti, um, not just the recent history, which I think some people have a, a bit more uh, knowledge of, but a bit of, uh, bit of the past history. But uh, before that, I thought I'd just uh, do a little bit of a, um, a rundown on some recent developments on Canadian foreign policy. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not only Haiti and planning invasion of Haiti that we, <laughs> that we have to be uh, uh, concerned about, but there's a lot of uh, uh, unfortunate developments in Canadian foreign policy again this week. Uh, a couple days ago, for, uh, Defence Minister Anita Anand was asked, how does your government see this war ending? Referring to Ukraine. And she just ignored the possibility of negotiation or any sort of mention of negotiation or peace accord. She responded saying, quote, I'm focused on continuing to provide Ukraine with military aid and equipment that it needs to fight and win this war. That has to be my focus as Minister of National Defense. Of course, it does not have to be her focus. She could also say, you know, she could even she could say there should be negotiations. She could say there should be a peace agreement. She could even say we're going to keep sending weapons, but we also think there should be a peace agreement. She could say we're going to keep sending weapons. We're going to keep Canadian trainers. We can keep can, 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 Canadian uh, special forces on the ground, but we also believe there should be negotiations. All that's possible, but she doesn't even want to mention the word negotiations or peace agreement uh, because they don't. They want to dissuade the Ukrainian government uh, from from um, from going down that uh, that route because the objective is more about weakening Russia than it is about peace uh, in in Ukraine and a proxy war ongoing is to the to the benefit for that. They announced this week uh, 40 more Canadian military trainers in Poland to train uh, Ukrainian forces. That's part of the Operation Unifier project that now goes back to 2015. Another $47 million in artillery, ammunition, drone cameras, satellite services, and other support to the Ukrainian military. And um, uh, on Friday, I, uh, on, on Friday, I, um, I, uh, interrupted a press conference that um, uh, Pablo Rodriguez, the minister for CRTC, uh, held here in Montreal on this issue. And uh, I thought I'd show you the, uh, the video. Can't hear it, Bianca. I know why. Just one second, my apologies. Yes. Does your government want peace in Ukraine or to weaken Russia? Do you want peace in Ukraine or weaken Russia? Mi Minister, Minister Rodriguez, Minister Rodriguez, your, your government has continuously sent weapons to pour to extend the conflict to fight a proxy war against Russia. Your, your government has soldiers on the ground. Your government has soldiers on the ground. Do you, are you concerned about nuclear war? Mr. Minister Rodriguez, are you, are you concerned about nuclear war? Are you concerned about nuclear war, Minister Rodriguez? Monsieur, Monsieur, pourquoi tu ne peux pas me répondre? Mais es pas, on, on, on parle d'une troisième guerre mondiale. On, on parle d'une guerre nucléaire. Et toi, c'est quoi ta réponse? Toi, you, 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 you have personally, you have personally, 
uh, uh, supported removing RT. You supported cutting off relations to uh, uh, artists that have uh, ties to Russia, right? You've supported this whole witch hunt. Do you, do you, are you concerned about nuclear war? Are you concerned about peace in Ukraine? Or do you want to fight a proxy war with Russia? Are you trying to weaken Russia? Is the Canadian government, the liberal government of Justin Trudeau trying to weaken Russia or peace in Ukraine? Why don't you ever talk about negotiations? Why don't you ever call for negotiations? We never hear about negotiations. Well, you want to expand NATO, the aggressive NATO alliance. Why don't you talk about negotiations? So that was a that was a fun little uh, fun little disruption. Uh, he of course didn't respond. Apparently, in the uh, that was a press conference about you know obviously an issue completely unrelated. In the uh, question period afterwards, he apparently responded uh, to questions about the disruption by saying that he was drafting a bill on social social media disinformation. And then said that online hate, quote, online hate, quote, doesn't stay online and takes to our streets. So he basically, I guess, was suggesting that I was engaging in disinformation on one hand and that it was hateful or something to that effect uh, on, on, the, on the other hand. That, um, and then the Canadian press story about it took the angle of, of disruptions, like ministers being in danger, uh, kind of like as, as they did with the, uh, the Christian Freeland uh, disruption maybe uh, well, six weeks, two months ago by some, some right-wingers in, in Alberta. And uh, as if like the, the concern about, you know, nuclear war <laughs> or the dangers of that were, you know, superseded by the danger of the fact that I got, I don't know, it was like, 15 feet was the, probably the closest I ever got to uh, uh, to Pablo Rodriguez. Uh, I didn't even attempt to get up on the stage. Uh, I started sitting down and I was actually sitting down for the first 10 or 15 seconds of the of the disruption. But nev nevertheless, the Canadian press focused on um, this sort of like worry about our, our, our great uh, leaders being uh, under threat from the, the dangerous uh, hordes out there. On a different note, the, the uh, uh, Canadian Global Affairs Institute is hosting a conference in Ottawa next week titled Putting Canadian Defence Procurement on a War Footing. And in the Ottawa Citizen today, David Buglesi reports that the... the um, uh, Puglesi reports that the, the uh, military is putting $50,000 into this uh, conference that's funded, the Canadian Global Affairs Institute is funded by a bunch of uh, arms industry uh, uh, companies. And the Canadian military has been pushing this idea that the, the arms industry not, needs to get on a war footing so they can provide more weapons to the Ukrainian military and also better arm for the war that the Canadian military, the head of the Canadian military says that China is currently at war with Russia, uh, um, China and Russia are currently at war, see themselves at war with, with the West, meaning including Canada. Um, so they want the, the ramping up of the arms industry to, to prepare for, for this, uh, uh, I guess, global uh, uh, conflict that they see. And anyways, it's just an uh, indication of how, first of all, how much the think tank world is, is sort of close and funded by the military, the arms industry, elements of the government, and, and how the kind of game works where the military floats an idea and then they get this like independent think tank to come host a conference promoting the idea that they're looking for. And uh, apparently they're expecting this to, to generate enough um, uh, attention to to really tip tip things in favor of um, of what they're uh, what they're looking for in terms of ramping up arms industry stuff. Um, on another note, Christian Freeland had a big speech that uh, she made a. Um,
sorry, my, my son just came in the room. Uh, and uh, the, the, um, so, so sorry. Uh, and uh, so Christian Freeland made a big speech to the Brookings Institute a few days ago where she made a big announcement about, about friend shoring and uh, alliance of democracies uh, in amidst the uh, Russian invasion that we have to build this new alliance of democracies. It seemed to got a fair bit of attention. It's supposed to be this you know, brilliant new uh, 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 plan from Christian Freeland. In the question period, there is a uh, questioner who, who uh, asks uh, a, a, an African, probably works for the, for the World Bank uh, or some similar type institution in, in Washington, D.C., he asks about whether the um, whether but basically that complains that that Ukraine has sucked up resources that could have gone or may have gone to West African countries, and Freeland has this very weird response where she sort of su suggests that that the problem with African countries is they don't have any they don't have a great leader like Vladimir Zelensky, and and also suggests that, that it's because Africans haven't died for democracy or their independence that they're sort of, things are difficult. Uh, kind of re referencing Ukraine and Ukrainians being willing to die for, for their independence. It's, it's quite a weird response that got a lot of negative attention online by leftists online. It's saying it's, it's racist. Um, it's not exactly clear to me what she's, saying it's very muddled but i think at, at minimum it's condescending and 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 possibly just you know outright uh uh racist and this elicited mocking of this by some people and then and then the, some people uh specifically as journalists at the um uh, national observer which views itself as progressive this max fawcett um uh, uh defending christian freeland's speech and not actually defending it but lauding christian freeland's speech uh, elicited a huge debate online um, and on, on Twitter. And Ma Max Fawcett, basically, he gets accused of being a psychophant of, of Freeland. And he basically uh, says that he, uh, uh, that, um, that the, the far left has like a, a derangement around. He says the far right is, is, is deranged around Trudeau and the, the far left is owned by, by Freeland. So there's some sort of like derangement around Christian Freeland, which I engaged with and I said, well, you know, she backed a coup in Bolivia, she backed a coup, uh, attempted coup in, uh, in Venezuela, she called Canada's bid for a seat on the Security Council, it would be an asset for Israel. Uh, she's been pushing for war with Russia for many years, decades, her granddad was, you know, pushing to break up the Soviet Union, uh, or, you know, pro-Nazi, and she was, in the late 80s, she was pushing to break up the USSR, and, and uh, you know, she excused Canadian uh, peacekeepers' you know, engagement in rape and sexual misconduct in Haiti. Uh, you know, there's this long list of very good reasons why um, uh, one would be uh, uh, not supportive of Christian Freeland, and, uh, and Fa Fawcett's response to this was to, was, of course, to just block me on Twitter, uh, uh, even though I was really quite, I was actually quite friendly about it. I should have been probably much nastier about it than I was. Um, and uh, it, it just speaks to how Christian Freeland is just wild. The media's portrayal, like almost all the way across the spectrum about Christian Freeland is just like such a effusive, like Christian Freeland is so wonderful. And, and it, I think it really reflects, you know, how foreign policy, how there's, it's on foreign policy the media coverage is the most biased it's just out of control how biased it is and the fact that freeland you know represents taking over canada came foreign policy from stefan dion who you know is a part of the establishment but a less pro-us a less pro-military element of the establishment and then freeland taking over and just like leading the charge on a whole bunch of different files um the you know the national post while they're generally critical of Justin Trudeau and generally critical of, of, of the government, they're actually quite pro-Freeland. 
Uh, but then also, you know, at the left end that's allowed in the, in the Toronto Star, they also, uh, uh, you know, are, are pro are pro Christian Freeland. Um, so it's a uh, it's a uh, I think Freeland really gives a window, and Ma Max Fawcett, this sort of like liberalish kind of uh, National Observer columnist, he gives a um, sort of a window into just how biased the whole media spectrum is. Uh, when it comes to, to foreign policy, and, and Freeland's a real a clear example of that. So, like I said, uh, or I think I, I, um, I actually maybe said in an earlier uh, interview today, but um, a couple hours ago, the Globe and Mail published a column titled, The Only Way to Save Haiti is to Put It Under UN Control. The only way to save Haiti is to put it under UN control by, I think it's like a Harvard school or uh, Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Government, government or whatever, uh, uh, academic. And today the UN Security Council is debating, I'm not sure what the final outcome is of uh, 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 a resolution calling for a, a military force in Haiti. Uh, Trudeau hosted a meeting, the UN ad hoc committee on Haiti that Canada has been leading for a long time. You had on Saturday, you had Canadian plane military jet and you had American a military jet in Haiti with uh, uh, a military aircraft with uh, bringing uh, uh, light armored vehicles into the country, uh, supposedly for the, apparently for the Haitian police. All of this push for a foreign military intervention in Haiti is comes in the context of a two month uprising of protests that began, I guess, uh, late, late August, uh, and then really picked up steam on September 11th when the Ariel Henry announced that they was cutting back a fuel subsidy. Uh, the, one of the only government supports in the country and it's fuel for, for driving, but also for, uh, for cooking fuel. So very poor people, of course, get hit very hard by increased cost of cooking fuel. And the protests are massive, huge demonstrations, blockades, uh, some looting uh, different different places. And basically, for the past month, the Canadian government has been leading this charge for this foreign intervention. You had Bob Ray that went down to Haiti, then Dominican, then you had Trudeau who hosted a meeting at the UN uh, three weeks ago in Haiti. Then you had Melanie Jolie 10 days ago at the Organization of American States Summit in Peru hosting a meeting on Haiti. And so the Canadian government is just pushing for this foreign intervention. Uh, in Haiti, and they got the head of the OAS to, to support it, then they got the head of the UN to support it, and and now it's, uh, and of course the, the, the Ariel Henry, the de facto leader in Haiti that they appointed 15 months ago, the US and Canada-led core group appointed 15 months ago, he, um, he's got behind uh, this idea of a foreign military intervention, and, and now they're, they look like they're moving forward with it. And there is no doubt there are problems with insecurity in Haiti. There's problems with gangs in Haiti. Uh, but the far bigger problems are the elite sectors, the oligarchy, mostly light-skinned oligarchy in Haiti that we, we've been propping up and supporting. They, their ties, their funding of the gangs, they're bringing in the guns for the gangs. The Haitian police that the King government has been supporting uh, announced $42 million for this year. Um, there's all kinds of links between them and the gangs. Um, and so the Canadian government, American government, using this, this question of insecurity to justify sending troops to Haiti again, uh, is, 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 um, is pretty remarkable. And it's really remarkable when you Think of the fact that Haiti has been under UN control basically since 2004. Uh, there was a 13-year UN military occupation of the country that over that came after the US, France, and Canada overthrew the elected government. That that introduced cholera to the country that left more than 10,000 dead. 
that was involved in all kinds of rape and sexual misconduct. So there's been a UN occupation, there still is a UN mission right till today, the, the thrust of the military ended in 2017, and then it was, there was the lesser mission for a couple of years, and now there's a lesser mission uh, that, that continues on, but the country's basically been under UN occupation. And so Haiti's primary problem is, you know, there are many, many problems, but its principal problem is a lack of sovereignty and a lack of respect for Haitian democracy from outside, right? And so, yes, in sort of theory, you know, some foreign forces could, could you know, weaken gangs grip in part of puzzle place or something like that. That is, that is possible. And you can even imagine a scenario where there, there are some slight short-term benefits uh, to, to uh, foreign troops. But it's just reinforcing the problem of outside domination of, of, of Haiti. And, and this is a long, this isn't new. It didn't just start in 2004. Of course, it's picked up since 2004. Um, but the you know Haiti is a country that has been dominated by foreign forces for for a long time, and so to, I think it's important to go into the history of some of this. Um, so after the earthquake in 2010, so people trying to make up their mind about you know is this military mission in Haiti today is it going to be a good thing or a bad thing? There's a horrible earthquake in January 2010, tens and tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands. Uh, die, much of Pojo Plants is destroyed, and uh, a few other uh, smaller, smaller places. The Canadian government doesn't send its heavy urban search and rescue teams to Haiti. So they have these heavy urban search and rescue teams based in Montreal, Halifax, Toronto, Winnipeg. They don't send them. Instead, they decide to send troops. And they send 2,000 Canadian troops. The Americans send, I think it's about 15,000. There already was about 8,000 UN troops in the country. And a year, a bit a little later than a year after the earthquake, it comes to light through an access to information request, why Canada sent troops. And the Canadian government, according to the Canadian press article, uh, wanted to uh, strengthen the Haitian authorities' ability to quote, to contain the risk of a popular uprising. And it says, quote, Polit political fragility has increased the risks of a popular uprising and has fed the rumor that ex-president Jean-Bertrand Aristide, currently in exile in South Africa, wants to organize a return to power. So when all of the world was concerned about the horror in Port-au-Prince, getting people out from under the rubble, basic health services, getting you know, water and stuff like that into the country, the Canadian government's reaction was worry about a popular uprising or the most popular politician in Haitian history returning from exile, right? And we had to send troops to control the country, not heavy urban search and rescue teams that are designed to get people out from under trap buildings or uh, basic medical services, but send troops. That speaks to just a complete lack of morality in Canadian foreign policy. And it also speaks to the, this sort of uh, focus on dominating the country. Now, later on in 2010, amidst the cholera, out the cholera outbreak that the UN created uh, by its dumping of feces in stream that people drank from. And even once cholera was introduced to the country, they continued to do the same reckless sanitation practices because they really didn't care about Haitian life. And amidst the rubble in Port-au-Prince and much of the country, the US and Canada pushed elections. They demanded elections be held on time because Rene Préval, who was then the president, was not viewed as completely compliant. So they pushed elections, and then when Preval's party's candidate was in second place after the first round, a very dubious first round runoff, because the, the conditions for an election just really weren't there to hold the election, Preval's candidate was in second place, and so the top two candidates should have gone to a runoff. The U.S. and Canada intervened, 
uh, and basically said that partly through an organization, American States Electoral Mission, basically said that Michel Martelly, who was a, a bit more than a, a percentage point below uh, uh, the uh, Jules Celestin, who was a Preval party's candidate, that he needed to, his numbers needed to be basically boosted. And they basically just started throwing out ballots until Marshall, Martelly's numbers were above Celestin's numbers. And the, the Haitian government, of course, responded uh, negatively to this, the, the, but the, they announced the threat to cut off aid, they threatened to cut off the uh, visas, including to Preval and his family, his, his, uh, his uh, uh, wife's kids were going to school in the US, so they even threat, threatened to cut off the basically visas to the president's families to be able to go to the US where the kids were going to school. And they basically forced Martelli into the second round. And then the second round happened. Very few people voted. Martelli won the second round. Martelli was a former a Tonton Makout for the uh, Duvalier dictatorship. He was, you know, the thugs that protected Duvalier dictatorship. He was somebody uh, pretty soon after taking office, he, he allows uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier to come back from exile. And he tells the New York Times that no one wants to prosecute Duvalier. No one has any problems with Duvalier. Um, you know, the people in his entourage convicted murderers, rapists, drug runners, etc. And so we have basically the US and Canada, Hillary Clinton even flies down to Haiti in, 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 in this context to basically put intense pressure to have uh, Martelli uh, go to the second round. And so Martelli uh, becomes president, refuses to hold elections. Uh, he appoints Jovenel Moise to lead his party to the next elections. And we basically go along with the charade of the elections. And so for the past decade, we've been backing up the PHTK regimes, uh, very corrupt, huge Petro Caribe scandal where you know the $2 billion of money from Venezuela basically got uh, stolen by the PHTK uh, crowd. And, and, um, and of course, when, you know, when Jovenel Moïse is assassinated, then we, you know, support uh, Ariel Henry, who, you know, leads the country today. So, so since the earthquake, Canada has been, you know, huge player in shaping Haitian uh, politics. Before the earthquake, of course, is a 2004 coup, which we helped plan with the Ottawa Initiative on Haiti, where we bring together the foreign forces that 13 months before the coup that plan to oust the elected government, to put Haiti under UN tutelage, and all that then transpires. And then we support this coup government where like our officials are the deputy justice minister during the coup government for two years. The minister is an, is an employee of USAID. The, the number two at the justice ministry is an employee of CEDA, our aid agency, um, which is, you know, all these political prisoners and uh, so we support this coup government. But then if you go back in history, right, if you look back historically Canada's role in Haiti, right, it, I wouldn't say it, it, it hasn't always been quite as imperialistic. There's a period uh, where the, in the 1990s where Canada's interventions were not as um, nefarious, uh, where they, where they um, were not aggressively working against democracy in the country. They were in varying degrees, but I would say they, there was a little bit of a sense that Canada represented a bit of a counterbalance to US power. Uh, but the historical record broadly with, the, with some minor exceptions at different periods, and, and there's some interesting element, explanations for that, uh, which maybe we can get into later. But, but if you go back to the Duvalier dictatorship, one of the things that enables uh, Francois Duvalier to come to power is that the, um, the only 19-day uh, uh, presidency of D Daniel Fignolet. So Fignolet is this very popular working class uh, with the working class in Port-au-Prince uh, politician. And he lasts for, he's, in, he's, he's president for 19 days before the military takes him out. And, and he basically, in, uh, in the research I did, he talks about how the US and Canada refused to uh, recognize his government. And that's part of what provided the military 
the the uh, ability to uh, to take him out. If you look at uh, Jean Claude with Francois Duvalier, there's some some a little bit here, a little bit there with Canadian uh, relationship to to the dictatorship. But certainly during Jean Claude Duvalier's dictatorship from the early 70s to the mid mid 1980s. Canada is a strong backer of, of, uh, of Jean-Claude Duvalier. And that's the time when the, the, the apparel companies, the sweatshop companies really start becoming big players in Haiti and Canadian companies uh, start producing uh, materials, baseballs, uh, t-shirts, et cetera, uh, from low wages uh, in that period. And Canada is a big uh, aid supporter uh, to, to uh, Haiti. And there's, there's uh, reports quasi-Canadian government reports that, that talk about in the mid-1980s how this aid was very much supporting the, the uh, Duvalier dictatorship. And you had um, uh, Duvalier, Jean-Claude Duvalier's top uh, PR representative internationally was a Quebec uh, portrait photographer, uh, Gabi Desmarais, who helped uh, build up the tourism industry. And he brought people like Elizabeth Taylor, Hollywood actors like Elizabeth Taylor and uh, uh, Vincent Price and Richard Burton uh, to Haiti and, and, and really helped uh, improve uh, Jean-Claude du Duvalier's um, PR internationally. There's an infamous um, uh, destruction of the Creole pigs, which were basically the piggy banks for, for peasants to, uh, where well, they had pigs um, uh, to pay for weddings and funerals and kids going to school. And in the early 80s, they wiped out the whole Creole pigs, huge, dev hugely devastating to the peasantry. And it was a Canadian US funded program that did that. Um, uh, Canada was right in the middle of that. After the Duvalier, after Jean-Claude gets forced out in 86, Canada really works hard to maintain Duvalierism through the different uh, uh, military governments for the next four years, actually becomes a really aggressive player uh, in, in that process, which is huge amounts of uh, military violence uh, uh, during that period. If you go back further historically, right, during the US occupation of 1915 to 1934, that's when RBC, Canadian Bank, uh, biggest bank, Sun Life Insurance, that's when they enter Haiti and they take advantage of that, of the, of the climate that the American military occupation creates to enter the country. You go back further and in the late 1800s, there's tons and tons of examples of the European powers of the US uh, with gunboat diplomacy in Haiti, where they send naval vessels to basically intimidate Haitian government, Haitian officials. And, and a number of occasions, those, those British naval vessels came from Halifax, right? Um, uh, from the, the, uh, the naval base in Halifax. And, um, and if you go back even further to the, the, uh, the Haitian Revolution and the, the Saint-Domingue, the, the colony of Saint-Domingue, the French uh, colony, there's a lucrative trade uh, between um, uh, Il Royal, which is today's Cape Britain, Cape Breton and uh, Prince Edward Island, and the French colony of Saint-Domingue, right? So there's cod, Canadian cod or Atlantic cod sent down to keep the slaves, uh, um, the slave owners wanted uh, high protein fuel to keep people working 16 hours a day in the slave plantations and they didn't want to devote the land to producing food for their slaves. And so uh, one of the ways in which they fed their slaves with, with, with the poor, qua, poor cod from the Atlantic uh, of provinces of Canada. Uh, and there's also slaves that go the other way, right? One of the, um, one of the big uh, uh, property owners in Il Royal uh, in the 17, mid, mid 1700s, uh, largest slave owner, um, uh, he was uh, in, in Il Royal, he was pre previously a property owner in Saint-Domingue and he brought about a dozen uh, slaves uh, uh, this way. It is also Acadians who settled in Saint-Domingue. At one point when the French wanted more white people in Saint-Domingue, uh, they, they turned to Acadians. During the, ha the Haitian Revolution of 1791, most of the, the uh, squadron, the British squadron in Halifax goes down 
to help the British try to take control of, of the colony, to put down the slave uprising and take control of the colony. And uh, a number of prominent Canadians, you know, pre-Confederation pre Canadians, uh, fight in, in, uh, in, uh, against the slave uprising, including uh, the first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, John Graves Simcoe, who actually leads the British invasion of Saint-Domingue in 1796 and reintroduces slavery uh, during, that, uh, during that period. Um, so so can, yes, Canadian imperialism in Haiti has really taken off over the past two decades. There's no doubt since you know, the early 2000s, Canada has been the second power in Haiti after the US and, and it's done you know, all kinds of, of um, anti-democratic, uh, uh, undercut Haitian sovereignty, supported regressive uh, uh, political actors. Uh, but it's not, it didn't just sort of begin in the early 2000s. There actually is a history of Canada uh, aligning with the British, aligning with the Americans, uh, pursuing its own uh, economic corporate interests uh, in the country. Canadian banks have been big players in Haiti for, for basically a century. And, um, and so to understand today, you know, to understand Canada leading this charge for foreign military intervention, to under, look at a bit of that history is important into sort of grasping uh, whether we should support a foreign military intervention. And uh, of course, I don't think we should. The, uh, I invite people to, to sign, uh, to, uh, to email MPs. The Canadian Foreign Policy Institute yesterday put out a action alert uh, calling on a no to Canadian military intervention in Haiti. And I invite people, uh, maybe somebody could put it into the chat. I invite people to, to send that to the Canadian Foreign Minister Jolie and all the opposition critics to, uh, to say no to that and to say that Canada should get out of the core group. Canada should stop supporting uh, Ariel Henry. And if you're in Montreal on, uh, on October 22nd, there's gonna be a uh, rally demonstration that, that begins at uh, Melanie Jolie's office. And then is gonna believe, I believe it's marching to, uh, to Justin Trudeau's uh, office. So that's at uh, October 22nd. Uh, I believe it starts rallying at 11. So probably we'll leave around uh, something around noon from uh, Melanie Jol Jolie's office. Uh, and I invite anyone in Montreal to, uh, to come out to that. And uh, I guess I'll just leave it there and people who have comments and questions, um, uh, go ahead. I think I might have my, uh, my regular problem of not seeing, uh, not seeing uh, any hands. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, let uh, our good friend Yuri uh, uh, announce if anyone's got any, uh, you know, questions. <laughs> no problem, Eve. Uh, so far, nobody has their uh, hands up or anything. So, uh, ah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Laura, uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're going to get to Laura after me. Uh, so, Eve, my my, I have two, uh, I have two quick, uh, quick questions to ask you then, and this might be a very this might be a very silly question, but I just have to ask this, uh, you know, seeing as we're talking about heights and so forth. And I've been so depressed by, uh, by the avalanche of propaganda on heights and the, you know, basically like the pro-war interventionism on the heights. But of course the usual, uh, but of course the usual people like the Black Alliance for Peace and whatnot have been campaigning against heights but Dr. Jemima uh, Pierre, who the CFPI had on, you know, was talking about how in Africa, um, the African Union is all for an intervention in, in, in Haiti, which I find, you know, really depressing. But I wanted to ask this, uh, the, 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 the indie rock band Arcade Fire, have, have them or, 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 or the popular uh, uh, DJ... Tranada or Canadian black artists like Drake or The Weeknd spoken out on what's going on in uh, Haiti and U.S. interventionism. <laughs> and I, I know that, like in Canada, uh, you know, most you know most people who speak out on imperialism are Canadians like Neil Young who moved to the United States and then speak out on like U.S. imperialism, but but but, but yeah, but 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 Arcade Fire they once did like a song, you know. Yeah. Yeah, Arc 
Yeah, yeah Arcade Fire, we've asked, uh, we asked Arcade Fire to sign a couple of petitions, public letters on Haiti uh, in recent years, and they've, uh, they've not gotten back to us. They have actually, some of the people in Arcade Fire have signed uh, other petitions on like fighter jets and stuff like that. And they, they've been heavily involved in Haiti. And the Arcade Fire people have gotten tied into the world of NGO world in Haiti. And, and uh, the NGO world in Haiti is not a, not a very good world. And, um, and they, um, so no, would be, the, would be the short answer. And, and, and I think it's really important for people to understand that like, it, yes, first of all, Haiti is very isolated. Right. Like, you know, in 2004, yeah. in 2004, CARICOM, the Caribbean community did criticize the coup and the uh, Jamaican president, I think mostly led by uh, Patterson. Um, I'm forgetting his first name right now. He he uh, he he criticized the coup at one point. Uh, Aristide was even in Jamaica for a short period and the Americans put a lot of pressure to, to, to for him to be uh, leave and they ultimately goes get exile in South Africa. Um, but, uh, but, uh, most of Latin America, the left governments in Latin America got behind the coup. Supported, uh, right? supported, uh, imperialism. And yeah, so they, they, they got that, they got behind, they got, they were part of the UN. Brazil, of course, led the military mission of the UN. Mm-hmm. Even, uh, even, a, a Bolivia, Morales is, even Morales is Bolivia sent troops, um, uh, wow. So Chavez, Venezuela didn't, and Cuba didn't. Cuba, they had a big uh, uh, health health school in Haiti that that uh, the Americans took over. The UN occupied. They actually t- they took the uh, the uh, the uh, medical hospital that the Cubans were training at, training Haitian doctors at, and they made that their barracks. The UN UN force. So they they basically all these I don't know what it was like a couple hundred uh, medical students, and there's obviously not many doctors in Haiti. And the Cubans were training them, and they 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 destroyed that. And but the Cubans actually brought them to Cuba to keep the keep the the, the training going on. Um, that was at the Aristide uh, Medical School that he'd set up. But uh, so so. Yeah, most of the hemisphere, and there's a long history of that, right? Of course, the the, the Haitians gave the uh, uh, Simon Bolivar, the mm-hmm. South American liberator, uh, all kinds of support, and then Bolivar basically um, betrayed them. Betrayed them uh, after, and the, and uh, uh, so you know, there's a lot of explanations for it. There's it's you know, part of it is is uh, anti-blackness, part of it is anti-Haitianism. And a lot of you know people point out in the Caribbean, uh, in, among you know among black people in the Caribbean, there's a lot of anti-Haitian sentiment. Dominican Republic, it's it's out of control. Yeah. And and in the Dominican, you you've seen actually recently online seen some photos of like, um, sort of like, like Dominican neo-Nazis who are they're real campaigning against Haiti right now in Dominican, and uh, and they're you know by Canadian standards they would be considered black, right? They're they're like you mm-hmm. know you know maybe not, you know, dark skinned, uh, uh, Dominicans, but, but certainly not lights, not, not white Dominicans. Um, some of them are. And, uh, so, so there's, you know, there's a linguistic element to it, right? Like, you know, Creole is the only place that speaks that language. So, you know, there's not Spanish that enables, you know, and only a French Haiti. colony as well. Yeah. And, and, and the French is a kind of a, the, you know, French in Haiti is a little bit of a joke because most people don't really speak French. And, and then how do you, you know, who do you interact with in French in the, in the region? It's sort of only Quebec. Um, so there's all kinds of elements to it, but it, you know, it's real. It, the country's isolated. It's, it's at the sort of the bottom and you can do, you can do, you know, what you couldn't do elsewhere, you can do in Haiti. And, 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 and as I pointed out in a recent piece, the lies, you know, the, the bigger the power imbalance between a place and Canada, the bigger the lies. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so when, when we, when we, when we were, you know, after the coup, when we were uh, paying for the cops that were killing protesters, peaceful protesters, and we were like paying for the officials of the coup government, that was aid, right? Like that, that we were aiding Haiti. We weren't, we weren't terrorizing Haitians. We were aiding them. That's how it was framed here. And, and, you know, right up to today, right? Like if you look at what Melanie Jolie said about what's going on in Haiti, she just, she talked about like Russian disinformation. So like the Russians were responsible for the protests in Haiti, but she doesn't actually really refer to it as protests because they don't want to really talk about just the disturbances in Haiti. And, uh, and then, you know, talking this whole business about sanctioning the gang leaders. 
like these are these are guys that like can't leave their neighborhood they're right like they're they're like stuck in like some not even in city soleil they can't even roam all around city soleil they're stuck in like one section of city soleil or they're stuck in uh, uh one part of bel air you, you know neighborhoods of paul prince and uh and and yet we're gonna like we're gonna sanction them so what they can't like come to they can't hop on the plane to come to Montreal or what they plan to do tomorrow like it, it's all sort of it's a kind of farce but it's it's designed to of course hype up the whole gang issue you know which is a real issue but you, you hype up the gang issue and you you downplay the um, the popular mobilization and the and the sort of political uh, underlying political issues. Um, so yeah, you know the Haiti is isolated. It's real. It's it's uh, there's many different elements to it, um, and um, and you know we should do what we can to uh, to break but it. Then, but, but then three very quick follow ups is uh, and you know you know sorry to ask this question, but I'm always curious <laughs> in if things are getting any better. Has the Black Canadian left as small as it is? Has have they gotten any? better like black lives matter and speaking out against uh uh Haiti. and then uh yeah and, and then and then the final question is uh you know i was arguing with uh well I, not not arguing but i was you know you know debating with some people about what's going on in uh, iran and i'm of the opinion that it's yet another you know us uk canada pan-european attempt to do another color revolution in Iran, and I was, you know, explaining why, you know, people should not be, you know, you know, prop, you know, why people should not be supporting, you know, the attempts to, to, you know, overthrow the Iranian government, even if there are legitimate uh, grievances. And uh, somebody on anti-imperialism, the, you know, the Facebook group with that I often share, you know, my work and, you know, and your work said, uh, you know, you know, you know, said, you know, said the following, you know, in response to, you know, the fact that so many of the protests are funded by the, the you know, the National Dome of Democracy, can and so forth, and propping up the MEK. If we, you know, we if we do overthrow the Iranian government, and Carol Moore, you know, was saying, is it possible to have a revolution without becoming a U.S. colony as long as you can keep the MEK out of power? And I, such the person, that's a very good question. I have no response to that. I'll ask Eve about that. So. Yeah, there's many. First of all, with regards to Black Lives Matter Canada, not really, um, you know, like a, a bit like Elle Jones is participating in this uh, an upcoming Canadian Foreign Policy Institute webinar. Um, but uh, no, there's not really I haven't really seen um, like black Canadian organizations that are really sort of taking up the Haiti struggle, uh, you know, in the in the past, there's some of the, the there was a Caribbean uh, paper in Toronto. Also, that the bookstore, uh, the Toronto bookstore, that's uh, sort of black focused bookstore. I'm forgetting name, uh, uh, forgetting the name of it right now. Uh, uh, they've they've actually been good historically on on, on Haiti, um, but uh, no, I mean for the most part, I mean even in the Haitian community here in Montreal, right, like. Uh, Fabienne Cola, who's who organizes this big Haitian festival in Montreal, she tweeted out yesterday the Canadian ambassador's interview with uh, Radio Canada, and in a sort of positive way, um, Marguerite, uh, Marjorie Villefranche, the head of the Maison d'Haïti, was quoted in Le Devoir saying Canada should should uh, you know well sort of a contradictory quote. She's saying one hand that that too much foreign intervention. On the other hand, saying Canada was well-placed to, to, to lead a foreign intervention. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the general rule is that the more accepted you are within the Canadian establishment, the more you accept Canadian imperialism. Wow. And, uh, and so the Haitian community uh, organizations um, that have established kind of themselves, they have, you know, they usually get government funding. They have, you know, they have a relationship to the dominant media. They mostly concede, you know, there, it's not the, the main opposition to Canada's role in Haiti, of course, comes from the Haitian community as well, right? Like the biggest, you know, the people like, you know, Jean Seville and people I've been involved with in yeah. Quebec, Haiti, of course, that's the, you know, the main opposition. But, but also it'd be really clear that, you know, when one example, like when we occupied Trudeau's office in 2019, the election about his role in Haiti and support for the, the, uh, the, Moise uh, 
regime, um, the liberals were smart. They sent a woman, uh, the chief of staff to a minister uh, of Haitian descent. So she had nothing to do with Justin Trudeau, but they were really clear. They made sure the person to negotiate with us was a woman of Haitian descent that they sent to, you know, like do that very good optics, kind of like diaspora identity politics kind of kind of uh, maneuvering that they, you know. And so, yes, they use Haitians to, you know, support, you know, Canadian imperialism in Haiti. And, and you know, if you look at, I mean, there's like it, there's a whole elements of Haitian politics, of this whole idea of the diaspora, in the Haitian diaspora, yeah. as the educated and the advanced ones, right? So there's a mm. whole like dynamic within Haitian political life, not obviously it overlays with the imperial context as well, but, but kind of a little bit on its own as well, this whole idea the diaspora, you know, the Haitians, basically people living outside of Haiti who are sort of doing well, looking at Haiti and saying, you guys are a mess and we are if we should be going back there and taking over the important positions and this kind of mm. that type of thinking and you know that's better I mean, the, the weaponized immigrants as yasha levine would call them yeah and so, so that's better than like you know the i don't know the canadian military going to haiti but it still plays into a certain kind of uh power uh, dynamic imbalance with regards to iran okay so yesterday the national the CBC, the national starts off with Iran. Okay. So we've got like three minutes about the prison, uh, the prison burning down. And, and it's just like, you know, basically three minutes of bad Iran, these protesters, and then it goes quickly to Haiti. Okay. And, and it's just like totally fascinating. It's like Canada. And it's like, now it's Canada is going to being supporting the government, the embattled government in Haiti. There is no protests. Protests are not happening in Haiti. They are happening in a very big way and they're really great and wonderful in Iran. They're not happening in Haiti. That's just, didn't, that didn't happen. Not, they're not actually been going for longer and bigger and, and being equally, equally violently repressed as Iran, but they're just like not, you know, <laughs> according to our public broadcaster. And, and then of course, Canada supporting the embattled government, but it's like, what's that government? The government's just like viewed as legit. So the Iranian government is not legitimate. But, we, but the Ariel Henry and, and, you know, whatever you want to say about the Iranian government, you know, as an atheist, I'm not keen on, you know, moral police and I'm not keen on forcing women to veil and I'm not keen on, you know, religiosity in government. But the Iranian government is far more legitimate than the Haitian government, right? Uh, I guarantee you it has more popular support and at least it has a structure <laughs> Of like a like an ostensible election kind of process that does not there's not even like there's not even a pretense of that with with Ariel Henry it's completely by any standard it's completely illegitimate. They're also uh, not ex they're also not exporting reactionary uh, theocratic yeah, so, movements but, like Saudi Arabia is. <laughs> yeah, so you, you can go into the Iran question more and more in all kinds of different different levels of 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 you know the history of Canada and Iran. That's just ignore. We back the Shah right until 1979. We were passively supported the overthrow of Mossadegh in, in, in 53. We, we are, you know, happy to support the, you know, we have no diplomatic relations with Iran, right? But, but we sell, we don't just have diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia, we sell them, their second biggest recipient of Canadian arms. And, and I, I was saying actually uh, bumped into somebody going to the, uh, 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 someone from the Iranian community at the Bibliothèque Nationale on uh, Saturday or Sunday, uh, and uh, going, he, he had a sign going to the, he was going to go to a, the Iran, Iran demonstration. I, I bumped into this guy and I started talking to him about like what he's asking for and stuff. And I said like, well, are you asking for Canada to restart diplomatic relations with Iran? And, and, and then I, and he said, no, he basically he kind of looked at me like, no, we're, we're asking for the opposite of that, which I knew was the case. And I sort of started pressing him on like, what did he thought about Iranians attitude towards diplomatic relations? And I, I don't know, I haven't seen a poll, but I would be astounded to find out that the vast majority of Iranians don't want a restarting of Canadian diplomatic relations. They don't want sanctions. They don't want to be isolated. Maybe the majority of, of Iranians, I'm pre totally prepared to believe that the majority of Iranians don't support the regime. I'm prepared to believe that they want a different political structure. I, I don't really know. I don't know enough 
you know, not confident enough one way or another how exactly how much legitimacy uh, it has. But I know, but I'm pretty confident that most Iranian, even people who don't like the government, don't want to be under like this, you know, economic and political pressure that the U.S. obviously leading, but Canada contributing to. Uh, like, you know, most Iranian, you know, you might have most Iranians don't like the regime, but they don't want Israel to be assassinating Iranian scientists, right? It's not. <laughs> and so, and so, if you, if you, if you, if you believe in, if if you like, you say you like stand with Iran. Right. If, if you're here in Canada and you're saying stand with Iran, well, it's pretty easy. If most of 80 percent of Iranians, which I believe close to that, around that, want not to be isolated, not to be sanctioned, then you should be calling for uh, Canada to not sanction and not isolate. And it doesn't mean you can't also say, uh, you know, no to the veil or no to the forced veil or you can even say, you know, down with the regime. You can, and say, <laughs> like we shouldn't be. But so, Eve, right? uh, but, 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 but Eve, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know. Just before I let uh, you know Laura ask her uh, question, because I because I know that we're pressed for time. But also, what's what, what's what really stuns me though about uh, about this weird, like you know, one eighty that the anti imperialist movement is doing on Iran is like several years ago. I mean, you could not get anyone to be protesting against. Uh, you know the Western Gulf aggression on uh, Syria for you, 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 you know for uh, yeah you couldn't get anybody to you know protest against the Western Gulf aggression on Syria, but she could get many people out in the streets protesting against any kind of threats on Iran, the the murder of General Soleimani, and uh, you know and people protesting against more sanctions on Iran's non-existent nuclear weapons program, but. With the recent uh, protests, I've even been surprised that communist publications have been saying we stand, you know, for the secular movement, for the feminist movement in Iran. When and you know, and I know this is going to be a controversial to say, but I actually interviewed, you know, a journalist who works on Press TV. But the the Iranian woman who was supposedly murdered by the Iranian police, she was not murdered by the Iranian police. Yes, it's yes, it was wrong that she was, you know, that she had to be questioned for how she wore her, you know, hijab and stuff like that. But she just felt, but she just died of like a heart attack in police custody. There's footage that's showing that. I don't know if there's any footage of of the police brutalizing her, but what we do know is that from 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 what from from what we see, this woman just died of, you know, heart failure, and yet we having we're having so many people saying yeah, we stand with Iran and and, and basically re, re, recycling propaganda and yeah and 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 basically again just being you know chumps for uh, you know chumps for imperialism. Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't delved into there's so many things going on <laughs> in terms of uh, Canadian foreign policy that 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 I haven't had the time to really delve into the ins and outs of what's going on in Iran. My inclination is that there's lots of good reasons to protest um, the uh, anti-woman uh, 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 nature of the government in Iran. Um, I also kind of feel that there, it's basically at some level, I won't go too far, like I don't know how to frame this exactly, but it's almost, I wouldn't go quite this far, but when there's so many sanctions against the government and a country and there's this effort to destabilize it in that way, even if you don't like a lot of what that government uh, does, uh, it's, it's our, like, it's, you know, I'm very disinclined to get behind a protest movement <laughs> in that country because it contributes to the, because this, what I consider an illegitimate onslaught against that uh, uh, country. And that's what I consider Canada's lack of diplomatic relations and sanctions. So it's, it's a very tricky situation to, to, you know, even if you support ostensibly what the protests are about. Um, but, but I think, and it's, it's, you know, it gets also to the point of like, where do we have power and where do we have control and where do we have influence? And we don't have very much influence in Iran and we have a whole lot of influence in Haiti. And the, the media kind of like flips it upside down in a, a properly functioning media, there would be like, you know, five times more coverage about protests in Haiti because the protests in Haiti 
are like directly targeting Canada. They're literally like holding up, you know, placards and elaborate props directly targeting Canada. And yet in Iran, you know, we're, we've already, we've already have no relations. We, we, right. And so, um, but that's not, you know, how the media works the other way around where it becomes just a tool of, of, uh, of uh, government uh, imperial uh, uh, policy. But do you, uh, think, do, you okay. think, do you think of the complete 180, though, from, from, from Iranian Americans who once upon a time, like several years ago, they would say no war with Iran, support the nuclear deal, even though I think the nuclear deal was was a crock because I don't think that Iran was, 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 was making any WMDs. But do you think that the reason why so many left leaning Iranian Americans are all of a sudden uh, jumping the shark when it comes to Iran, because uh, I, maybe they just feel that maybe this time around under a Democrat administration, under a liberal government, they'll be able to take power when, come on, like, we know what happens when like imperialists do this game. Like I've, I, I think we've all lived through enough, you know, nonsense of color revolutions and imperialist weaponizing legitimate grievances to know that like that, that even if the Islamic Republic is overthrown, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be the MEK in power, or it's just going to be like, you know, or, or even if secularism does reign supreme, they're just going to be another puppet of like the U S Canada and, you know, in Israel, and I just don't understand how people just don't ever learn from. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> from, I, I don't, from, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about uh, uh, Iranian politics to, to have a sense of really what, what would, what comes. I think that I, I certainly would caution as I did to the person I talked to at the library uh, from the Iranian community uh, that, you know, look at Libya, look at Syria, mm -hmm. look at Afghanistan, look at Iraq, look at that, you know, the, the, these things don't tend to work out well when you start calling for Western sponsored regime change. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to go there. I think, you know, it is possible that you could have, you know, uh, a more secular regime, the more secular government or whatever that, that you know, uh, and I think it's even theoretically possible that you could have a government that continued with its sort of, uh, yeah, if you want to call it resistance strategy in the in the in the in the Middle East, where it you know opposes uh, Zionism and opposes American uh, domination to some extent, at least, which Iran does to some extent, with uh, you know its support for Hezbollah and 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 other kind of uh, policies. Um, but but probably not. Uh, probably it's going to work out. It would probably go. It would probably go bad. And um, I'd say a hundred percent. So <laughs> so you know I would be very cautious on that. But so are there any other uh, comments or uh, questions that people have? Anything about Haiti? Or uh... well, you already answered the question I had. Even I'm just going to say when you're doing disruptions and things on Haiti, surely there must be at least some Haitians in Montreal that actually could accompany you. There must be some. I mean, we, we need to hear from Haitians other than those who are in established accepted organizations getting you at Canadian dollars. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think most of the Haitian community in Montreal is opposed to, mm -hmm. to, to uh, foreign intervention. I think that's the case. But, but it, it tends to be, obviously, the people who, have, who are given the megaphone by, by the established media tend to be the ones that go along with the... Uh, with the Canadian government's uh, uh, perspective. I'm curious to see who, the, how big a demonstration this is on the 22nd. It's not organized by Solidarité Québec Haïti, which is the, the group of sort of like anti-imperialist activists uh, uh, from the Haitian community that I, that I was part of. It's that group's kind of gone dormant. Um, uh, so, so it's from a different group, which I'm not familiar with. Um, uh, so it's be curious to see what the what the actual turnout is. But yeah, there's you know there are and same thing in New York and Boston and, and uh, Miami. There's there's you know groups of of uh, Haitian uh, activists who are challenging the uh, U.S. policy and uh, and uh, and um, whatnot. But uh, um, but yeah, it's it's uh, you know the ba the basic rule is that the you know the the longer you are here and the more tied to uh, the power structures of Canada, 
you know, and a lot of it can be genuine. It's not just like putting it on for, because you like if you if you just watch, if you're somebody who's been here for 25 years and you become like a reporter at Radio Canada and most of the news you intake is Radio Canada or, you know, other major media outlets, you look at Haiti just like you know, a, a non someone that's not of Haitian background looks at Haiti. Right. I mean, that's that is um, that's how most of the uh, news that the Haitian community Montreal gets on Haiti is the same outlets that the most Montrealers get. Obviously, people in the Haitian community tend to also get some of the Haitian community media and some other you know, voices as well. So they tend to have at least heard the other side and heard, you know, but, but um, yeah, so, um, but that, that's why it's important. And also, it's really also really important that within the, the you know, when it's outside forces supporting um, you know, the times when there was a better, slightly better Canadian policy towards Haiti, it's when the Haitian community was really united, when the left in Quebec was backing the Haitian community's kind of perspective, and quite frankly, when there was a bit of a division within the U.S. politics. That's when there's some periods there within the 90s where there's slightly better uh, uh, Canadian uh, uh, policy. Um, and some of those dynamics, I think, you know, can can sort of be recreated, uh, at least over the medium term, um, if there is some, you know, organizing and activism on the issue. But uh, unless there's any other questions, it's past, uh, past the hour mark. Um, same place, same time uh, next week. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>